Welcome to Read Aloud for September 24th, day nine. Here we go. I'm actually gonna play a song that I made up when I was like 16 or 17 years old. And every once in a while I play it just to keep it refreshed in my mind. It goes something kind of like this. And so at last they came to the last homely house and found its door flung wide. Now it is a strange thing, but things that are good to have and days that are good to spend are soon told about and not much to listen to, while things that are uncomfortable, palpitating, and even gruesome may make a good tale and take a deal of tailing anyway. They stayed long in that good house, fourteen days at least, and they found it hard to leave. Bilbo would gladly have stopped there forever and ever, even supposing a wish would have taken him right back to his hobbit hole without trouble. Yet there is little to tell about their stay. The master of the house was an elf friend, one of those, one of those people whose fathers came into the strange stories before the beginning of history. The wars of the evil goblins and the elves and the first men in the north. And those days of our tale, there were still some people who had both elves and heroes of the north for ancestors. And Elrond, the master of the house, was their chief. He was as noble and as fair in face as an elf lord, as strong as a warrior, as wise as a wizard, as venerable as a king of dwarves, and as kind as summer. <gasps> venerable. Hey, that was our word of the day from a little while ago. See? You see how they're using venerable to refer to the elf lord? Elrond? Pretty cool, huh? He comes into many tales, but this part in the story of Bilbo's great adventure is only a small one, though important, as you will see, if we ever get to the end of it. His house was perfect, whether you liked food or sleep or work or storytelling or singing or just sitting and thinking best, or a pleasant mixture of them all. Evil things did not come into that valley. I wish I had time to tell you even a few of the tales, or one or two of the songs they heard in that house. All of them, their ponies as well, grew refreshed and strong in a few days there. Their clothes were mended as well as their bruises, their tempers and their hopes. Their bags were filled with food and provisions, light to carry but strong to bring them over the mountain passes. Their plans were improved with the best advice, so the time came to Midsummer Eve and they were to go on again with the early sun on midsummer morning. Elrond knew all about runes of every kind. That day he looked at the swords they had brought from the troll's lair and he said, these are not troll made. They are old swords, very old swords of the high elves of the west, my kin. They were made in Gondolin for the goblin wars. They must have come from a dragon's hoard or the goblin plunder for dragons and goblins destroyed that city many ages ago. This, Thorin, the runes named Orchrist, the goblin cleaver in the ancient tongue of Gondolin, it was a famous blade. This, Gandalf, was Glamdring, foe hammer that the king of Gondolin once wore. Keep them well. Whence did the trolls get them, I wonder, said Thorin, looking at his sword with new interest. I could not say, said Elrond, but one may guess that your trolls had plundered other plunderers, or come on the remains of old robberies in some hole in the mountains of old. I have heard that there are still forgotten treasures of old to be found in the deserted caverns of the mines of Moria since the dwarf and the goblin war. Thorin pondered these words. I will keep this sword in honor, he said, may it soon cleave goblins once again. A wish that is likely to be granted soon enough in the mountains, said Elrond. But show me now your map. He took it and gazed long at it, and he shook his head, for if he did not altogether approve of dwarves and their love of gold, he hated dragons and their cruel wickedness, and he grieved to remember the ruin of the town of Dale and its merry bells, and the burned banks of the bright river running. 
The moon was shining in a broad silver crescent. He held up the map and the white light shone through it. What is this, he said. There are moon letters here, beside the plain runes which say five feet high the door and three may walk abreast. What are moon letters? asked the hobbit, full of excitement. He loved maps, as I have told you before, and he also liked runes and letters and cunning handwriting, though he wrote himself, though what he wrote himself, ha, though when he wrote himself it was a bit thin and spidery. Moon letters are rune letters, but you cannot see them, said Elrond, not when you look straight at them. They can only be seen when the moon shines behind them, and what is more, with the more cunning sort, it must be a moon of the same shape and season as the day when they were written. The dwarves invented them and wrote them with silver pens, as your friend could tell you. These must have been written on a midsummer's eve in a crescent moon a long while ago. What do they say? asked Gandalf and Thorin together, a bit vexed perhaps that even Elrond should have found this out first, though really there had not been a chance before, and there would not have been another until goodness knows when. Knows when. Stand by the grey stone when the thrush knocks, said Elrond, and the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. Durin, Durin, said Thorin. He was the father of the fathers of the eldest race of dwarves, the Longbeards, and my first ancestor. I am his heir. Then what is Durin's day? asked Elrond. The first day of the dwarfs' new year, said Thorin, is as all should know, that first day of the last moon of autumn on the threshold of winter. We still call it Durin's day when the last moon of autumn and the sun are in the sky together, but this will not help us much. I fear, for it passes our skill in these days to guess when such a time will come again. That remains to be seen, said Gandalf. Is there any more writing? None to be seen by this moon, said Elrond, and he gave the map back to Thorin. And then they went down to the water to see the elves dance and sing upon the Midsummer's Eve. The next morning was a Midsummer's morning as fair and fresh as could be, as it could be dreamed. Blue sky and never a cloud and the sun dancing on the water. Now they rode away amid songs of farewell and good speed, with their hearts ready for more adventure, and with the knowledge of the road they must follow over the misty mountains to the land beyond. And that is the end of that chapter. Did you see how they introduced elves in that chapter? I wonder who's going to be introduced in Over the Hill and Under the Hill. There were many paths that led into those mountains, and many passes over them, but most of the paths were cheats and deceptions and led nowhere or to bad ends, and most of the passes were infested by evil things and dreadful dangers. The dwarves and the hobbits, helped, helped by the wise advice of Elrond and the knowledge and memory of Gandalf, took the right road to the right pass. Long days after they had climbed out of the valley and left the last homely house miles behind, they were still going up and up and up. It was a hard path and a dangerous path, a crooked way and a lonely and and a lonely and a long. Now they could look back over the lands they had left, laid out behind them far below, far, far away in the west, where things were blue and faint. Bilbo knew, Bilbo knew there lay his own country of safe and comfortable things and his little hobbit hole. He shivered. It was getting bitter cold up here, and the wind came shrill among the, among the rocks. Boulders, too, at times came galloping down the mountainsides, let loose by midday sun upon the snow and passed among them, which was lucky, or over their heads, which was alarming. The nights were comfortless and chill, and they did not dare to sing or talk too loud, for the echoes were uncanny, and the silence seemed to dislike being broken, except by the noise of water and the wail of wind and the crack of stone. The summer is getting on down below, thought Bilbo, and haymaking is going on, and picnics, they will be harvesting and blackberrying before we even begin to go down the other side at this rate. And the others were thinking equally gloomy thoughts. Although when they had said goodbye to Elrond in the high hope of midsummer morning, they had spoken gaily of the passage of the mountains and the riding and riding of swift across the lands beyond. They had thought of coming to the secret door in the lonely mountain, perhaps that very next first moon of autumn, and perhaps it will be Durin's day, they had said. Only Gandalf had shaken his head and said nothing. Dwarves had not passed that way for many years, but Gandalf had, 
and he knew how evil and danger had grown and thriven in the wild since the dragons had driven men from the lands and the goblins had spread in secret after, after the battle of the mines of Moria. Even the good plans of wise wizards like Gandalf and of good friends like Elrond go astray when you are off on a dangerous adventure over the edge of the wild, and Gandalf was a wide, wise enough wizard to know it. He knew that something unexpected might happen, and he hardly dared to hope that they would pass without fearful adventure over those great tall mountains with lonely peaks and valleys where no king ruled. They did not. All was well until one day they met a thunderstorm. More than a thunderstorm, a thunder battle. You know how terrific a really big thunderstorm can be down in the land and in the river valley, especially at times when two great thunderstorms meet and clash. More terrible still are thunder and lightning in the mountains at night when storms come up from the east and west and make war. The lightning splinters on the peaks and rocks shiver, and great crashes split the air and go rolling and tumbling into every cave and hollow, and the darkness is filled with overwhelming noise and sudden light. Bilbo had never seen or imagined anything of the kind. They were high up in a narrow place with a dreadful fall into a dim valley at one side of them. There they were sheltering under a hanging rock for the night, and he lay beneath a blanket and shook from head to toe. When he peeped out in the lightning flashes, he saw that across the valley, the stone giants were out and were hurling rocks at one another for a game and catching them and tossing them down into the darkness where they smashed among the trees far below or splintered into little bits with a bang. Then came a wind and a rain and the wind whipped in the rain and hail in every direction so that an overhanging rock was no protection at all. Soon they were getting drenched and their ponies were standing with their heads down and their tails between their legs and some of them were whinnying with fright. They could hear the giants guffawing and shouting over the mountainsides. All right, we're gonna stop there, but it's got a really cool picture. All right, thanks.